very excited that Barbara Ferrer is here. She just arrived minutes ago. So um, thank you. <laughs> Safe travels from the airport and all the way up here. So um, Barbara's going to be talking about racial equity, and she is the chief strategy officer with the Kellogg Foundation. She joined Kellogg Foundation last year. And she's relatively new to philanthropy, so she's learning a lot about the different types of foundations and, and how they operate and how they work. Her background is in public health. She worked with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. She also was the executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission, a very large organization, a multi-service health organization. And she comes to her work with a very strong background with a master's degree in education a master's degree in public health also, and also her doctorate degree in social welfare. So she brings a rich academic background and a very rich public health background and education to her work. And we're very excited to have her here today, um, helping to pull some of the pieces of the conference together on racial equity. Um, thank you so much, Amy and Kathy, and I really want to thank all of you both for being here and spending the day together, uh, and also for inviting me to speak. It's, it's a deep honor, and I'm looking forward to actually meeting uh, all of you who are staying at the reception and, and at the dinner and getting to know more about your work. I know um, a little bit from my colleagues, uh, the wonderful New Mexico Kellogg team that's here, Kara and Alvin and Robbie. Um, also, Becky is here from our communications team. So, you know, I know a little bit about your work. I know a lot about the work um, that so many of you are engaged in uh, in New Mexico. And, you know, I just, I'm thrilled that um, we've chosen to spend a day really thinking about uh, philanthropy and equity, um, which is something near and dear to us at the Kellogg Foundation, but I also think it's a shared value across uh, many communities in this country. So, you know, I wanted to spend a little bit of time, you know, just sort of grounding us in you know, who the Kellogg Foundation is, and you probably know that as well as I do, um, the kind of work uh, that we're engaged in. And then I wanted to really just flip and look at um, what does, uh, why, why is uh, racial equity in particular an important focus for us at the foundation? What does it mean for our work? I want to share some lessons that we've learned along the way both um, lessons that we've learned at the foundation, but also I think lessons that we've learned from all the different communities that we're working with. Um, I think as Amy said, you know, I was the health commissioner in Boston for many years. I ran a high school in Boston, a district high school. I was a community organizer. I've been close to work um, that so many people have been doing to really, you know, bring about transformational change on behalf of children and communities, but really with a, an explicit focus on making sure that we tackle issues related to racism. So I'm, I'm glad we're going to be able to have that conversation today. I'm hoping that I talk for you know no more than uh, 20, 25 minutes, maybe it gets a little long, half an hour, but that I leave plenty of time for us to talk together as well and, uh, and be able to enter into dialogue and hear from you about your ideas based on the work that you've been doing. Does that, does that sound okay? And we're a small group, so if anything I'm saying along the way needs some clarification, don't wait. Um, if something I'm doing or saying, I'm going to show some data slides, so in particular if I'm showing something doesn't make sense, just you know, definitely let me know and I'll try to explain it. Um, but we do, we have a vision and a mission at the foundation. Um, you know, we envision a nation that marshals its resources to assure that all children have an equitable and promising future, a nation in which all children thrive. And we're explicit about understanding that what we're really talking about is that all children have the opportunities and resources they need for optimal development. Um, and so, so we, we're talking about resources from the very beginning, um, about how, how that contributes to the ability uh, for children and their families um, to be able to marshal the resources that they're going to need um, to grow and to, um, to thrive, both as individuals and as a collective community. Um, we support children, families, and communities as they strengthen and create conditions that propel vulnerable children to achieve success as individuals and as contributors to the larger community and society. And in particular, we're grounded uh, in the legacy of our founders. So Mr. Kellogg, you know, back in 1930, had a vision of what it would take 
in order for children to do well. And when he set up the foundation, he was explicit that our job as, uh, as keepers of his legacy and uh, his, the resources that he gave to the foundation, uh, we had to make sure we promoted the health, happiness, and well-being of children. But he had a deep understanding of how he went about that work. And um, he, he talked over and over and over again um, for the next uh, five decades, four decades, around the importance of intelligent study, cooperative planning, and group action. Um, that rooted in the ability for children to thrive is this notion that communities know best uh, what it is that they need to do to create the conditions uh, that would allow them to flourish. And that they have the inherent capacity to do that work as long as it's supported with intelligence, study, cooperative planning, and group action. So you know, early on, I mean, this is, this is really an organizing strategy. Um, and it really, uh, pays a lot of respect to the notion that uh, people need to get together. Uh, they need to work together, and they need to work together in authentic and meaningful ways. But in order for that to be effective, they have to have access to what we call practical knowledge of the foundation. Information that helps you understand the world in which you're living in. Information that allows you to make good decisions uh, for yourself and for your community. Information that allows you to understand how to build the kind relationships and partnerships that will end up in what Mr. Kellogg called knowledge-based cooperative community programs. Um, and you know, we, we interpret the word programs uh, generously now. So we're, we're really talking about actions. Uh, we're really talking about systems work, we're talking about policy work, and we're talking about practices when we talk about programming. Uh, but we're still grounded in this, you know, I'm gonna call this a theory of change now. We're still grounded in this deep understanding that in order for us to see equitable outcomes for children, we need to focus on practical knowledge, mobilized communities, a skilled leadership, and community-driven results-oriented uh, actions. Um, and we take from the legacy that Mr. Kellogg left us a particular lens around understanding the relationship of this work um, to tackling issues related to racism. And so our, our commitment um, to our work and to our partnerships in our community is to come to this work using a racial healing and racial equity lens. And I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, well, what does that really mean. Um, but it grounds everything we do, both internally and externally, in our work. Um, we're also, because of the legacy of, of uh, Mr. Kellogg and our deep belief in the fact that communities have the inherent capacity to do for themselves, we're very focused on community and civic engagement. And all the many uh, different manifestations that community and civic engagement will take depending on the communities we're partnering with. And we understand as well the need to support leaders. Um, Informal leaders, formal leaders, rising leaders, um, uh, all need acknowledgement and support as they work closely uh, in their communities. Uh, many of you know that we're particularly focused on young children, uh, children zero to eight and their families, and that we do our work uh, with an idea in mind that what we're trying to achieve are uh, that all children are healthy, all children are educated, and all children live in economically secure families. Uh, over the last uh, few years, we've uh, really focused heavily on what we're calling our place-based partnerships. Um, in these communities, in Mexico, Michigan, Mississippi, New Orleans, uh, in Mexico, we're in the office of the Yucatan, and in Haiti, we're in two micro regions. We've pledged to be there for 25 years, um, to work next to uh, all of the wonderful people in those communities and the organizations in those communities to bring about the kind of change that allows children to thrive. Um, and so many of you know uh, us well because of our New Mexico work, but we have similar commitments in these other areas as well. And look forward to you know our work and our partnerships both with philanthropy uh, in those named places, but also with our community partners and the residents that live, work, and play uh, in those communities. Any questions? Is that, I'm kind of going quickly, 
so that we'll have time to talk. But um, so I want to I want to stop for a minute. I want to look at a little bit of data, um, and I, I want to use this to really explain um, why, in fact, we're so focused on issues around uh, racial equity. Um, and so, I'm, you know, first I want to look a little bit at New Mexico, and you all live here um, and, and work here, so I don't, none of this data is new, but sometimes when you see it all on the graph, you can't help uh, but uh, understand the moral imperative to act and act soon. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you look at New Mexico, you'll quickly realize that this is a state where the majority of people who live here are black people of color. Um, the largest group of people, uh, largest community of people uh, are, your Lat are Latino uh, people who live here. Um, there's a significant number of Native Americans, American Indians who live here. Um, there's also uh, obviously folks of other races and there's a significant population of African Americans in the state. Um, on the measures of unemployment, median household income, poverty, educational attainment, um, the picture is pretty similar. Uh, where people of color, all people of color, do far worse than white residents uh, in this state. Um, and you can see uh, in some places, uh, it's one and a half, uh, people of color have, are one and a half more times likely to be unemployed, uh, particularly Native Americans. Uh, the median household income is 44, about 45,000. Uh, for whites, it's about 55,000. Uh, for Native Americans here, it's 32,000. And it's about 34,000 for African Americans and Latinos. Uh, poverty, uh, African Americans, uh, Native Americans, and Latinos here all have significantly higher rates of living in poverty than other residents and than white residents in particular. And if you look at health outcomes, um, the pattern it remains the same. So I think there are 15 commonly collected health uh, outcome data points on this table. And for everything except lung cancer deaths in New Mexico, people of color are faring far worse than everybody else. And some of the data is stark. So at the very beginning of life, Infants of color who are, I mean, infants who are black uh, here uh, in this state have almost, are almost three times more likely to die in the first year of life than white infants. And the death rate at the end of life is highest for black residents. And in between that, you'll have uh, startling facts like Native Americans die of diabetes four and a half, almost four and a half times more than white residents. Um, and if you go back and you look at the obesity rates, which we all know can contribute significantly to diabetes, um, you'll see uh, only about uh, one and a half times the rate of <coughs> obesity amongst populations of color, particularly native and black. Um, but the death rates associated with diabetes are significantly higher for people of color. Again, you know, ask, we need to ask ourselves some very serious questions here about what's contributing to sort of an overall picture uh, where health outcomes are far worse if you're a person of color, even though this is a state where the majority of people are people of color, and where, in fact, on mortality rates, you see these huge upswings. Um, and it, Albuquerque, uh, not much different uh, in terms of the picture. Um, Again, the majority of the people that live in Albuquerque are people of color. Uh, and again, unemployment rates significantly higher. Uh, again, Native Americans have the highest unemployment rate, uh, the lowest median household income, and uh, the lowest, I mean, they're the most likely to be living in poverty. Um, the picture on health outcomes is equally distressing. Um, here, there are no health outcomes. Uh, in Albuquerque and in the county, um, where white residents are doing worse than residents of color. For every single health outcome uh, that you routinely collect information on, uh, residents of color do far worse um, than everybody else. And again, the gap on infant deaths is profound. So um, 
It's hard to imagine that we today are in uh, a city the size of Albuquerque where the death rate for black babies is 20 babies are dying for every thousand births. That's a higher rate of death than it was for white babies 30 years ago. So we have made progress on infant mortality and we've made progress across the board, but we have not done anything to narrow the gap. And um, the rate of death in black babies in Albuquerque is higher than it is in some of the poorest countries around the world. Cuba has a death rate, a total death rate, of four deaths per thousand births. Uh, even in countries um, in, uh, in Central America, like Costa Rica, you do not see a death rate of 20 babies per thousand births. So we have a huge issue here um, that is directly associated uh, with the color of your skin and the experiences that you have because of the color of your skin. Um, and I did this scatter plot. I don't know how, how easy it is to see, but um, green, uh, the green dots stand for uh, white people, and the yellow dots stand for Latinos, and all of the other colors are for people of color. And what you'll notice is Albuquerque is a city that uh, has a lot of residential segregation. Um, where there are parts of the city that are predominantly white and parts of the city that are predominantly uh, places where people of color are living. And you know, this isn't just Albuquerque. This is really just about every city in the United States. So I'm not. This isn't a special circumstance. But the reason it's important to look at this is, you know, we all know place matters. You know, sort of where you live has something to do with the uh, uh, resources that might be available that might uh, promote well-being, as well as the exposures that might limit your well-being. Um, so I, I put this up there because I think it's important for us to know that we've got terrible outcomes by race. We have a lot of, a fair amount of segregation uh, by race. And not surprising when we looked at a child opportunity index, which is a nationally recognized index that um, I think it has about 19 indicators that it looks like educational opportunity, health and environmental opportunity, social and economic opportunity, when they collect data and give a composite uh, score based on the standings in each of these indicators, uh, the darker colors stand for places where there's more opportunities for children to do well. The lighter colors stand for places where there's less opportunity for children to do well. And you'll notice immediately that this looks like a scatter plot of where people are living. Those communities that are predominantly communities where people of color are living, we see far less opportunities for children to thrive than those communities uh, where predominantly white residents live. The question uh, becomes, uh, always when I sort of show the data, is, is what really causes the inequities that we all talk about? Um, and you know, oftentimes people first go to, uh, this is something, uh, that's really rooted in the individual behavior of folks. So when you look at the fact that high school graduation rates aren't high in communities of color, or they're having poor birth outcomes, babies are dying more, or they have high unemployment rates, lots of people immediately <coughs> sort of go to, you know, perhaps they don't take care of themselves well. Uh, they may even go to perhaps they don't have good access, maybe they don't have insurance. Um, they're not really focused on education, they don't have a good family um, life that's naturally contributing. Um, they, lots of people will go, this is really not about race, it's about poverty, and we should really be talking about poverty and the distribution of income. Um, but the reality is, when you look at the data on any one of these uh, indicators that I presented, particularly on the health indicators, and you control for poverty, you still see a significant gap by race. So for example, on infant mortality, black women who are middle class, college educated, have uh, poorer birth outcomes than white women who've never graduated from high school 
and live in families with income under $10,000 a year. Uh, that's, that's national data and that's local data. Um, black women who get um, good prenatal care, you know, they have adequate prenatal care, marker that they're kind of taking care of themselves, have worse birth outcomes, much one and a half times more likely to have a baby die in the first year of life than a white woman who's gotten absolutely no prenatal care. Black women who don't smoke at all, one and a half to two times more likely to lose their baby in the first year of life than white women who smoke every day and smoke while they're pregnant. So some of the things that you know, we automatically jump to is that these are the reasons that cause these inequities. Um, really, in fact, both they're not true and they don't contribute enough to the gaps that we see that we should um, say that that's what we need to be focusing on. I'm not saying that income isn't important. I'm not saying that women should smoke when they're pregnant. Uh, it's really important not to smoke when you're pregnant and it's really well established that having money helps you have the kinds of resources and opportunities that can contribute to your well-being. But it doesn't explain the gap. The gap is actually probably explained by the unequal distribution of resources and opportunities over many generations. We have a legacy of slavery, we have a legacy of colonization, taking away people's lands, forcing them into unproductive land, forcing them into smaller pieces of property, forcing them to migrate, and we have issues related to structural racism um, that, that we have perpetuated over the generations. So it's no surprise that if you look at foreclosure rates in any city in America, you will find a disproportionate burden of foreclosures and, uh, in, for, for families of color, households of color. Um, in Boston, you know, which is where I came from before I was in Michigan, 80% um, of the foreclosures, 80% of the foreclosures in this last, um, this last sort of the last decade, uh, were for families of color. 80%. Targeted. That's a targeted effort on subprime loans that were made. Um, and that didn't just happen by chance. Um, when you look at how we fund education, property taxes, you know, sort of a double penalty on uh, people who are poor. And particularly when you look at residential segregation, uh, which exists uh, almost everywhere in this country and our cities, you can understand what, I, what I'm really trying to get us to think about at least is sort of the impact of these structural barriers to allowing folks to have access to the kinds of resources and opportunities that they need. And when you couple that with then differences in experiences related to implicit bias, acts of discrimination, cultural incompetence, and the cumulative stress of, of, of being other in this country, um, you can understand that what we really need to look at are what are the factors that are at play here if we really want to talk about how we can impact uh, the gaps that we see. Um, I think without that, you know, we, we allow ourselves uh, a false sense of security um, that we can actually address some of the issues we're much more comfortable addressing um, and, see, uh, and see significant improvements. You know, his, history will tell us over time that we're not closing the gap, um, and, uh, you know, significantly. Um, and in the places where we are closing the gap, there are lots of examples that people have started dealing with issues around structural racism and access to opportunities and resources. Um, so, for us at the Foundation, you know, we're driven by looking at the data and understanding the experiences and hearing about the experiences um, that people are living in our community. Um, and it has allowed us to really put forward this notion that we should be using a racial equity lens for all of our work. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out what exactly does that mean. Um, but I would say for us there are probably three things, three, three places where we think it shows up best. One is um, actually setting equity goals that are measurable. Um, so an equity goal is a goal that says that, you know, we're striving for equity. What we're trying to do is not lift all votes. We're trying to lift the votes of those folks who have the worst outcomes so that they can get to the place where those people uh, ha are ready to have the best outcomes. 
Now, you know, you can do that lots of different ways, but you have to actually talk about narrowing the gap. And you have to know where the gaps are. Um, otherwise, you end up uh, inadvertently improving infant mortality rates without closing the gap. Um, we also feel like a racial equity lens uh, demands a set of values. Um, and inherent in those values is the notion that um, people most affected by issues and challenges uh, often un both understand those issues best and understand what are needed for solutions to those issues. Um, and so we need to really emphasize with the racial equity lens, you're constantly talking about a two-way communication channel. You know, it's not enough we're, it's, it's, it's not enough for us to say we have good information, let me give it to you. Um, you know, we who are here with lots of resources have some good information that we want to share. Even if we want to share it in an appropriate way, it's equally important for us to acknowledge that there's lots of good information in communities that we need to understand and that we need to, uh, we need to use ourselves um, as we try to be good partners. Um, and that, you know, that sharing of information really starts with the notion that we respect community knowledge. Um, and if you're going to respect community knowledge, then you've got to figure out a way to understand and learn about that knowledge that sits in uh, our communities, that sits among the residents and the organizations that are working hard in those communities. And, um, you know, that's been important for us at the foundation because I think it's, it's been a, a different way for us to understand what it means to uh, really be respectful of, of everyone and everyone's contributions. Um, and then I think the last issue for us is, has been uh, a racial equity lens will call for a realignment of resources. It does call for thinking about a different way for those of us who are in philanthropy of thinking about um, how, to use, uh, how to use our resources and how to create uh, and who we should be creating partnerships with. Um, so I don't think um, you can have a racial equity lens and not end up uh, with having conversations about how to realign your resources. Um, I think it would actually demand us to think about other ways of both doing our partnerships and thinking about where our resources are best, uh, are best used. Um, so we, we've, you know, over the years we've developed some sense of some strategies that might be helpful. Um, as we think about doing this work uh, more competently. Um, and one is um, this notion of building our knowledge base um, so that we can, as organizations, philanthropic organizations, develop both institutional and personal competency <coughs> to engage in a, a sustained effort to, to really address issues related to racism. And this is hard. I think that this is really hard work. Um, we have a hard time uh, talking about racism in this country. Uh, those of us with white skin have a hard time talking about white privilege. Um, we have a hard time um, listening uh, uh, actively um, and intently uh, to the narratives and the stories that people need to tell us. Um, and you have to be willing to go both on a personal journey and an organizational journey at the same time. That's really hard. Because you know, we're all in different places um, when we come to this work. And we all have to grow. I mean, that's, that's, we all have to grow and just, just to be good people, I think we're always growing. Um, but to allow people to have time and space for a personal journey while you're trying to move your organization on an organizational journey is, is difficult and hard work and takes a deep commitment. Um, but we don't think we can be good partners if we don't take on this task. So you know, many of you know that the, the board at the Kellogg Foundation uh, embraced the notion that we are striving to be an anti-racist organization. I mean, we're explicit about what we're trying to do with our internal work and our internal commitment. And we would urge organizations to think hard about what their commitment is as well, uh, if they, if they want to be the best partners that they possibly can be to build a, a more racially just uh, world. Um, the second strategy that we've really, um, you know, come to recognize its sort of central importance, and you can see Mr. Kellogg told us this, you know, in 1930, 
is around resident engagement and community empowerment. And you know, we call it community organizing. Um, but but it's, it's central to the work. And uh, we, we really recognize that also that sometimes is hard for us as well. Um, because I think as philanthropic organizations, we often have ideas about the kind of work we want to see happen. Um, and what we think are the best practices. And you know, we too grapple with the notion of you know, making sure we're being good stewards of our money. And that means okay, some accountability. And sometimes that is hard to do when you're asking and allowing communities um, to really lift up their own voices and their own ideas. Um, so I don't think this is easy. And I think the other part of that that's not easy is um, racial equity work isn't just within our institutions. It has to happen within our diverse communities. And, so, and you know, for us, that looks like racial healing. You know, we actually call the coming together of diverse communities to understand each other's stories, to tackle issues around implicit bias and white privilege as um, a, coming, a racial healing journey. Um, and so part of supporting resident engagement and community empowerment is also creating space for racial healing in our communities. Um, and the last thing is this sense that um, we can't go at this alone. Um, none of us can do this alone. I mean, no one sector can do this work alone. And, um, and we have to uh, probably think harder about what does it mean to strengthen our partnerships across the diverse sectors. You know, how do we work effectively with residents in our communities, with community-based organizations, with business, with uh, the faith-based community, with elected officials? Um, you know, what does, what does that work need to look like? And as a philanthropic organization, what's our responsibility um, to show up uh, differently in that space in a way that actually allows us to come together uh, in these strong partnerships that go across many sectors. So I would say, you know, for us at the Keller Foundation, you know, we, we look at these three, uh, you, know, loop, you know, sort of legs of the stool as being opportunities for us to think about how to do our work uh, in, in a way that's, that uh, really honors our commitment to, to racial equity. And, you know, just some examples, you know, what, it, what does building the knowledge base mean? You know, community-led participatory research and evaluation. Um, you know that the heart of that is really allowing the community to decide what information they need to better understand the conditions that they're living in and what's affecting their opportunities. Um, culturally competent metrics and assessment tools. You know, whether you're in education or you're in health or you're in uh, you know working around economic family security, we we don't do a good job here. Um, on, on measurement, and we don't do a good job on assessing. So, you know, that this is a whole area where I think, you know, there's lots of rich work and brilliant people that are starting to focus on this. We just need to, you know, get ourselves uh, in, that, in, that, in that space as well. Um, you know, I, I'm a big one for, you know, how do we um, help each other understand what are some of the best practices or policy practices that are out there um, that really are supporting equitable outcomes and how do those stories get told and how does that information get circulated so that many people have access to it. Um, one area that you know, we're coming to probably later than some of you even is you know, understanding the importance of continuous improvement and learning you know, for ourselves as organizations, but more importantly for all of the organizations we're working with in our communities. Is how do we help folks identify what are the models that help you build uh, an anti-racist organization. Because, you know, that's a learning journey. Um, and, you know, what, what, what does that look like? And what do we know from the work that lots of other people have done in this area that would help us all move this forward? Um, being able to really focus on policy systems and practices um, and, you know, not always um, be uh, very grounded in sort of a service delivery system without understanding sort of uh, some of the other influences on those systems. And then the last one, which I think the, the foundation has, has embraced and, and actually uh, has done work for years that I think um, many of us working in the field have, have recognized and used, is work around narrative change. You know, how do we make sure that the authentic stories are being told about the experiences that people are living, particularly people of color? 
where's the space for that, and how does that show up? Um, and then, you know, I did want to say, you know, part of building the knowledge base is understanding that it's, again, it's all about communication. Like, this information has to be accessible. There has to be this two-way street. Good information coming in, good information being able to go out uh, to lots of people so that uh, it's, not, it's not sort of a, a closed community that has access the, to the kind of knowledge that really helps you make a difference uh, in the work that you're doing. Um, and then when we think about mobilizing for change, um, you know, again, we start with this sense that, you know, the, the place that work always begins when folks are, are trying to, to get to a different place is understanding what's going on and being able to come together across a diverse set of, uh, of stakeholders and develop what you think is your common and shared agenda. And, you know, in order to do that, you know, capacity building, is really important. Um, and for us, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, learning from each other is really important. Um, making sure that we're really paying a lot of attention to being inclusive in our ways of bringing ourselves together so that we're not inadvertently leaving folks out either because of linguistic differences or cultural differences. And then, as I said before, you know, we feel like we all have to constantly be on a journey around racial healing when we're working uh, with communities and side-by-side uh, -side, uh, in community. Um, and I talked a little bit about you know, this, so I'm, I'm not going to touch much more on it, but you know, I think, I think um, appreciating the leadership that's there, um, both informal and formal, is, you know, really, as we think about um, how communities naturally come together and work together, leadership is a huge part of that. Oftentimes, we get very focused on formal leadership and we forget to appreciate informal leaders and local leaders um, that are emerging. Um, and I think one place where you know, we as a foundation have found it helpful for us um, to, to be engaged is around local and national networks that really support leaders. Um, so again, you get that peer-to-peer -peer exchange, um, but there's also opportunities for people to learn and grow in those networks. And, and we have found this to be very helpful um, in helping us both you know, get really, you know, really share good knowledge, but also really helpful on sort of the mobilization strategies that actually can be effective. Um, and then, you know, when we think about partnerships for change, you know, we're really about realignment of uh, systems. Um, so that, you know, really what we have are systems, whole systems, uh, holistic systems that support a child well-being. And that we're doing that uh, by grading public and private resources. One of our roles is, you know, that we're good at, I think, in philanthropy is leveraging. Um, and I think that's important. And I think leveraging, in particular, public resources uh, becomes more and more important uh, today. Um, and then really thinking about uh, what are the outcomes that we need to be looking for so that things become scalable. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this issue around outcomes because I think we all get confused here. I know we do at Foundation Server. What, what, is, what, is, what does a return on investment really mean if you're committed to racial equity? Um, but I do, I want to just pause for a second before we sort of get to the challenges and you know, uh, talk about why I'm hopeful, uh, both personally and why our organization is hopeful. We think that we're, we're in a place where we should be and uh, a deep commitment to racial equity pays off. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about Boston. Um, I'm just going to use one example. I want to talk about infant mortality because it's, it's almost intrangible. I mean, it, it, it hasn't budged in most places in terms of the narrowing of the gap. Um, so I, I'm going to look at rates in Boston um, over uh, about a, almost a 12-year period. And I'm going to look at this because I was in Boston this 12 year period. And work started, fits and starts around addressing the gap in 2000. Um, and you can see that while we haven't closed the gap in Boston, we have narrowed the gap significantly. And in fact, um, in this last time period that we have data for, infant mortality data often lags, um, we've, uh, we're, 
the infant mortality rates for blacks is the only infant mortality rate that continues to show a statistically significant decline. Um, and you see that no matter how you cut the data. So if you look at infant mortality rates for the first 30 years, a uh, 30 days after birth, and then for 30 days up to the full year, you can still see this pattern of significant decline in the rate for black babies. Um, and it's matched by a decline in low birth weight, which we know contributes to high infant mortality rates, and preterm births, both factors that really contribute a lot. And you can see on all of these, you know, the, the place where we're actually having significant change right now is on the rates for black babies and seeing improvements in those birth outcomes. And you know, people ask, you know, what changed? Um, I think the first thing that changed is starting in 2000, we started talking about racism in Boston and the impact of racism on birth outcomes. Um, and we used our data to tell stories that were real stories about what was going on, to dispel the myths that black women's babies were dying in the first year of life at four times the rate of white women in a city that has universal health care coverage. Because that even back in 2000, everybody's health care, if you didn't have money, you can get free health care in Boston. Uh, that had, we have 25 community-based health centers for a city that's only slightly larger than Albuquerque. And all of those health centers offer free care. We have 11 birthing hospitals. Um, so this was a resource rich. We have academic centers of excellence that train all kinds of health professionals. And back in 2000, black babies died at four times the rate of white babies. And we needed to start telling the story about what that really was and what it wasn't. Um, and we needed to be in communities, and we needed to allow the people who were experiencing this to tell their stories, um, to give them information and opportunities that allowed them to actually counter the narrative that was out there about what was causing high rates of, of poor birth outcomes. We also made some strategic decisions to stop uh, targeting resources for poor women and to target resources in small for black women. And that was hugely controversial in the city of Boston. Uh, many of you know Healthy Start is a program that really used to reduce uh, inequities and in outcomes. Uh, but Healthy Start in Boston just targeted poor women and didn't really target black women. And so what we saw was the rates were improving for white women and they weren't really improving for black women and we weren't closing the gap. So we actually took all the Healthy Start resources and we created programming that was very specific to the needs of black women. In creating that programming, we focused on maternal health before women got pregnant, um, in between their pregnancies. Really the notion was focus on maternal health and maternal well-being so that women feel well-supported. Uh, reduce the stress, uh, reduce the stress associated with racism, um, address issues around housing and stability, which is particularly hard in a very segregated community, um, and really think about improving social cohesion and support. Now, these were all issues black women raised. These weren't issues that other people said, this is what you need. These were the things that women said, this is what helps me have to feel healthy. This is what helps me take care of myself. These are the kinds of issues that are really bothering me right now. Um, and then it was, you know, what kind of opportunities and resources needed to be in our neighborhoods that primarily uh, are occupied by people of color that, again, are health promoting. So, you know, how do you cut down uh, unhealthy air quality? How do you improve safety in parks? How do you improve walkability? And really concentrate those efforts in communities that have often been left out of those opportunities. Um, and I think um, this contributed uh, significantly to the reductions in infant mortality rates and reductions that we're seeing in some other rates as well. Um, and it's why I feel so hopeful that um, if you, in fact, you know, can embrace the notion that a lot of the gaps are, in fact, caused by issues related to racism. And we can come together and tackle that and build racial equity, engage in a journey around racial healing. Um, we can start making uh, great strides. And those strides translate 
uh, to life and death for some people, and certainly for improvements in access to opportunities and resources. But I don't think the work is without its challenges. Um, and I don't have answers to these challenges. But I wanted to note them, because I think this is where the conversations need to happen. Um, one issue that we always come up against is how do you address inequities? It's very, you know, we can talk about positive, let's build racial equity, but at some point you have to acknowledge the gaps. And how do you talk about the gaps without further stigmatizing those folks who have the worst outcomes? When I was a headmaster, uh, you know, I was in high school, was, all my kids were, you know, it was a district high school, Boston public schools, and district high schools, all kids of color. And you know, I, 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 you know, I had all this health data and education. I, I was really into like, you know, let's come together as a community and let's really tackle these issues. And you know, kids would tell me right to my face, like, Miss, like, why are you showing us this? This just makes us look bad. You shouldn't talk about this data. This data just makes everyone think we're losers. You put this data up that says that we don't graduate, you know, at high rates. You put this data data up that says we have higher rates of STDs. Like whatever. This data just is making us look bad, and we don't want to hear this, and we don't want any part of this. Um, and I think that's reality. Um, and that is the conversation that we need to have, is what does it mean to talk about authentic stories in a way that doesn't diminish self-worth, and continue the story of devaluing the individual lives of people in our community? You know, because who's getting blamed? Uh, is a big question that's out there. So I think as we think about this work, we have to really embrace the narrative change work that comes along with it so that it doesn't end up further stigmatizing and furthering some stereotypes um, that already exist. Um, and um, you know, internalized racism is a huge issue uh, that um, comes into play. Um, so, so we need to be mindful of not perpetuating, however well-intentioned we may be, not perpetuating stories that devalue the individual lives, that don't tell what's authentically happening, uh, that don't really highlight the root cause issues in ways that people can understand and talk about. But I'd be anxious to hear more from you on you know, what, what, what your experiences have been. And then, you know, sort of how do we talk about racism? the impact of racism and racial healing in communities that already are divided, in communities that are already very diverse and have lots of different histories, and come to the experiences around racism through different lenses, through lenses of migration, through lenses of um, oppression, through lenses of um, annihilation. I mean, so you know, where is their space on the racial healing journey? to understand in this country, we've got lots of histories that need to be shared and understood. Um, and and um, we've got to create space for that so that we can all work together. Um, and I don't think that's easy either. And I think, you know, we, it's mixed how successful uh, folks are in uh, really trying to have um, and sustain that racial healing journey um, and, and bring in folks who aren't already, already, oh, I haven't already started thinking about these issues and grappling with these issues. Um, you can't just have the people who understand racism in the room or who experience racism in the room. You've got to have the people who are perpetuating racism in the room as well. So, um, and then the last one is, you know, what, how does philanthropy, how can philanthropy help and how do we make sure we're not a gatekeeper uh, standing in the way of of equitable opportunities. And I particularly highlight that issue because I think it comes up for all of us around accountability. And uh, you know, what are the outcomes uh, that we should be hanging our hats on? Um, and what do we think a return on investment looks like? You know, many of us have boards that we're responsible to, um, or in other organizations we may be responsible to, donors that we're responsible to. So how do we figure out a way for us to stay true to this work, which we know is going to take a very long time, identify ways that we can demonstrate that we're making progress without falling into, show me that for every dollar that's getting invested here, uh, you've got a return, 
that's either equal to that dollar or greater than that dollar. Because um, it's hard sometimes to put dollar amounts on values around relationship building, on leadership development. So, and, you know, I'd be interested on how you all have been thinking about this, and I know that we could share some of the ways we've looked at this at the foundation. Um, but I close by saying it's okay not to have all the answers uh, right now. I, I actually don't think we should have all the answers. I don't think we should wait until we have all the answers. I think what we need to do is change the questions um, that we're asking of ourselves. Um, and so, you know, I put just some examples here, sort of a conventional question that we may have asked or we may still ask is how can we promote healthy behaviors? I would suggest that instead we say how can we target dangerous conditions reorganize land use and transportation policies to ensure healthy spaces and places. They're just different questions, and they get you to different places. Uh, the conventional question, how can we reduce disparities in the distribution of disease, educational attainment, and economic security? We might be able to switch that to say, how do we eliminate the inequities in the distribution of resources and power that shape child outcomes? I'd say in the past we may have said, what social programs and services do we need to address disparities? And now we might want to ask ourselves, what are the types of institutional and social changes that are going to be necessary to tackle inequities? And then the last was, um, you know, how do individuals protect themselves against these disparities? You know, sort of what's, what can I do as one person? And you know, I, I don't think that that's very that important, but I think for us, for me, we should be asking at least as a corollary to that, what kinds of community organizing and alliance building are necessary to protect communities. Um, and so, you know, for, for me it's like, I don't, I don't want anybody to ever think at the foundation, at our foundation, we, we have all the answers, because we don't. Um, what I think we've done is um, tell ourselves how important it is to ask the right questions and to really struggle uh, when things get tough um, and to understand um, that, you know, we're driven by a set of values that are really, really important and uh, need to continue to guide us um, on our own personal journeys, institutional journeys, and our journeys in partnership with you and, and the communities uh, we're in service of. So, thank you and uh, happy to take questions and comments and your ideas. And, you know, I know there's a lot of wisdom in this room and so you know, I don't want anyone to to think I'm trying to claim a, a special space. I'm just, this is sort of where we are in the foundation. Um, and I, I know that lots of good work is happening in New Mexico and there's a deep commitment to equity, uh, racial equity here. Um, so be anxious. I think people should just share. They don't even need to direct these questions at me. Just, you know, feel free to share your own experiences, your own questions, comments. <laughs>